Greetings, dear friends. Today in the Alatra TV studio, we welcome the esteemed Igor Mikhailovich Danilov. Greetings. And Ekaterina. Greetings. The topic of our video today is how to find oneself. The point is that the search for oneself and one's mission in life is a problem for people at any age, both in youth and in their old age. It is interesting with what result they approach the end of their lives. People are disappointed with how they lived their lives. We came across a very interesting study by British scientists. They surveyed people in their 70s and found out the following, that all people in their old age regret that they worked at a job they didn't like, that they lived with people they didn't love, that they didn't engage in sports, didn't travel or ate unhealthy food when they were young or throughout their lives. And the question arises, but if the circumstances had been such that all this was in their lives, would they feel happy? Well, firstly, what does it mean, all people? In Britain. I doubt that all the people. The majority? Yes, the vast majority, but not all. There are those people who are happy even in their old age. And as for the question that if there had been other circumstances and if everything they had listed that disappointed them in life had happened, would they be happy? Such people wouldn't be happy because, first of all, they are unhappy, not because they didn't work at their favorite job or lived with the people they didn't love, but because they didn't find themselves. They failed to accomplish the main and the most important goal the goal for which a human is here. And that's what has disappointed them. While we are young, we seemingly have a lot of time, and we realize that we still have a lot ahead of us. We can do a lot. But when the old age comes, opportunities disappear. And we understand, we have only one perspective left. There is no longer any other. Then comes the awareness and understanding of our life which has passed aimlessly. And if a person has no purpose in life or the purpose is false, he is not living. People set goals, they strive for them. When they reach them, they realize that those were not the right goals and that eventually disappoints them. That's an interesting point about goals too. There is a second study by Harvard scientists, which is today entitled A Revolutionary Study in Psychology. For 75 years, they have been studying what makes people happy and where one should invest all his resources, all his strength and all his time. And they have come to the conclusion that it is necessary to invest all your attention, all your resources, say, internal resources, in a relationship, in building a relationship with another person, that happiness is in good relations with people. This is in human understanding. What shapes our daily life? First of all, it is relationships with people around us. And it is believed that if our relationships with people around us are good, then our life will be good, because we won't worry about anything. We will be calm. We will achieve what we aspire to. Tell me, do we aspire to establish relationships with people around us? Actually, it's natural. And that's how it should be. Our relationships with people around us should always be good. That's right. But any relationships with any people begin in our head, then in their heads. It doesn't matter what someone thinks of me, it matters what I think of him. After all, my relationship with someone is primarily formed in my head. Even if a person hates me, for example, treats me badly, slanders me, and everything else, the question is, do I understand him or not? If I understand him and understand who controls him and why he does this, it means, that I have no animosity towards him, no anger, no hatred, which he has towards me. And for me, he doesn't exist as a problem. So I don't live with him, or I don't live with this grudge against him. I don't hold grudges, so I live in peace. Yes. That's how my relationships are formed, even with those 
who hate me, figuratively speaking. This is very valuable, about holding no grudges against anyone. Of course. Because it is first of all these grudges that pull you down if they are in you. That's right. And here is the simple question. Who feels better, a person who is filled with hatred or me? Who lives more peacefully? After all, he falls asleep thinking, he wakes up thinking about it, not even understanding who in him hates and why me or someone else. What difference does it make? When a person is filled with hatred or anger, it eats him. It's like rust that destroys even the strongest metal. It is hatred and it's destructive. Yet how can people learn to accept another person the way he is? First of all, you have to learn to accept yourself and understand who you are until a person understands who he is, who he really is, not the one whom his consciousness draws or who appears to him, or something he aspires to. Well, basically, we aspire to those images which consciousness suggests to us, to those images which we see and want to liken ourselves to. That is visible images. But who is the real you? Until you understand it, you won't understand another person. That's also a very interesting question about who am I. After all, addressing psychologists, what answer do people get? That you are a set of, let's say, both shortcomings and merits of some kind, meaning of some qualities. And what kind of letters do people even send sometimes about the fact that once left one-on-one -on -one with myself, I wondered, who is the real me? And I realized that… And the answer is hidden in this very question, and few people think about it. And unfortunately, Psychology, we understand what it is, what kind of science it actually is. It does not reveal this point. After all, in the question itself, in these words already, the answer is hidden. Think about it, my friends. Once left, one-on-one, -on -one, with myself, I, there's already an understanding of who I am and who I'm one-on-one -on -one with. It's also such an interesting point when you start to wonder, well, let's say we're all born in this world and we have a choice. What is our future? What is our destiny in the future? How to adapt or to survive in this world? Such kind of walking around in circles starts. So you feel inside that something, you'll get a profession, you already have a career, everything in the world, and stability in relationships. But there is such a feeling as if you are walking around in circles and you can't get out of it, like you're missing, it doesn't fill you with this inner thing. I mean, it's like you must get this education and you must sort of settle down, but there is still this anxiety inside and the fact that you are like… And now you are saying, you must, you must, you must. Tell me, my friends, does anyone owe anyone? And when you owe someone, do you sleep well? Or does anybody sleep well when they owe somebody? And the very understanding when you must, you owe, gives anxiety and emptiness. While inside, the true human nature, the spiritual nature in a person requires something different. It requires self-fulfillment in this, in fulfillment of the best qualities. And when there was no knowledge, there was no allotter in life, let's say in my life, then there was sort of wavering and misunderstanding of how to get out of the circle. When the knowledge already appeared and when I already became familiar with the Who Am I practice, having read the book Alatra, I had an interesting observation. I mean, there was just a sincere desire to understand where these actors' mindsets from childhood are in your head, which you are accustomed and stuck to, already considering them to be yourself, and where this true self is, which keeps pushing you forward to search for this true fulfillment. That is, in daily life it's like you are getting fulfilled, or already are fulfilled, but it doesn't give this inner satisfaction, doesn't give this peace. And here, there's such an interesting point, it turns out that you add this practice to your arsenal with honesty to yourself, you start performing it, then there comes such an interesting effect that when you plunge into it and start asking yourself the question, who am I? And hear very diverse answers. We shared with friends. And here it is interesting. Who is giving these answers when you ask a question? For some reason, psychology does not provide answers to this. Who is talking to you? Is this the work of our consciousness or schizophrenia? 
But definitely not you. That is, you actually don't request this answer yourself. But it's yourself. clearly not you. You don't request the answer after all. Absolutely right. This is interesting, yes. And they don't go deeper for some reason. Why? Even those who engage in, say, neurophysiology, psychiatry, psychology, well, all around, say, various sciences. I can't call these sciences otherwise, because they beat around the bush, but are afraid to take a look inside. And when they encounter that understanding, it scares them. And they start to fear it immediately run aside and begin fogging up all this truth. Why? Because they fear they will be called lunatics. Right. It's the phobia of psychologists and psychiatrists. When neurophysiologists come to this understanding, they get scared, panic and retreat. Why? Because as it turns out, there's something unknown. They encounter metaphysical manifestations, which science is unable to explain. So, if science can't explain this, but I'm going to start talking about it, then what will they think of me? I have a simple question. Why don't they ask themselves, but who is it actually? Reacts in them in such way. Exactly, in them. And who will react in others, those whom they are afraid of? When you seek the truth, you are a genuine researcher devoted to one goal, to find out who the real you is, the true. who the true you is. When you don't lie. And you come into contact with this knowledge, this truth, there come two things. I mean, if you truly seek, then when you find this answer, it's like the illusion gets destroyed. Consciousness is in pain, and it might experience utter discomfort, and it might shout, but you feel easy. You finally understood everything, because pieces of the puzzle have come together and you've discovered something greater. But if a person is defending these illusions, then this point is extremely sort of burns or causes some kind of… Discomfort. He starts freaking out and running yes, away. Yes, fear and discomfort arise. Yes, there's also an understanding why there is such a reaction. Why? Because a person faces something that would destroy his whole elusive life he has formed. And the person is on the verge of realizing that there's something that breaks all these established patterns, all the illusions in his head, in his life. And he begins to understand that he's nobody, he knows nothing, he cannot do anything, and he's totally dependent on and manipulated by someone. And this is absolutely terrifying for people. For consciousness. It is primarily consciousness that is afraid. Consciousness is afraid of being unmasked. For the devil is afraid of what? Of being exposed, my friends. What do all the holy scriptures of all religions talk about? About unmasking of the devil. Yet, what do people do? They look for him in others. They look for him in something somewhere else. But no one looks for him in themselves. Well, those very holy scriptures say that God is very close to you, like an artery. One artery, whereas the other artery is the devil, who is also very close to you. However, people forget about that for some reason. How would a learned man get into religion? Yes. Why would he stoop to religious fanatics, to sectarians and the like? After all, he's a scientist. But at least every person being honest with himself understands who is the real self. He's got lost in all this multitude of images that he is kind of both good and evil, that he is kind of an artist, a scientist and a dancer, all in one package, and these roles are contradictory. Both a beast and an angel. Good and bad. Inside one person, yes. Of course. Who am I among all of those? Nobody, until the self is shaped. Yes. A person in his life is, you know, like a shuttlecock in badminton until he finally chooses his side. On the one hand, he relies on some humane, spiritual position. On the other hand, he turns into a beast, hates everyone and himself. He's unsatisfied with his life. And thirdly, he is ready to sacrifice everything for someone. And in this way, Maybe due to the fact that this final life goal is substituted, meaning if a person had a goal to learn himself and come to God, if he had some Honesty. determination to help people, but sincerely. After all, if you are a scientist, you can do so much. If you are a scientist who observes himself and studies his consciousness, then it expands your capabilities. Yes. But if you have a life goal to earn a comfortable place for yourself or something, a title, a career, then you're like a bobber. You are on the surface, and the system manipulates you as it pleases, using fears, desires, your future, your past. 
this. And thanks to this knowledge that has come to this world, I'm no longer that bobber. And I'm endlessly grateful for that. And you realize there is a purpose in this life which is noble, and it should exist, because otherwise what's the point? Of your existence. You were born in a mortal body, and so what, that's it? Yeah, and also people ask, but how come? I don't want to die, I'm afraid to die. What should I do in order not to be afraid? And so here there is this knowledge which enables you to become part of the living world, become part of the spiritual world. Let's go back to these very studies that elderly people were surveyed and they were disappointed, let's say, and discontented with their life. Why? Because they understood that they had lived in vain. And do you know what the most pernicious thing is for them? The fact that they understand that they will face what is called death. Inevitably. Of course. All of them will be discontented, those who are discontented, only with the fact that they haven't gained life. After all, death is pernicious and terrible for those who don't have life, whereas for those who have life, there is no death. Meanwhile, many people boast they are not afraid of death. They say, death is nothing… It's a lie. But a protracted, long-lasting sleep. You simply fall asleep and that's it. No, this is an attempt to persuade oneself and an attempt to persuade others. It is often used in psychiatry. When a person comes with his fears, this especially relates to people who are elderly or falling ill. Fear arises in them and it is necessary to somehow support and calm them down. However, when there is no knowledge and understanding, when there is superficial knowledge of religions, after all, psychology studies religions, but superficially. And how does psychology study religions? Just as a tool to manipulate the masses as an organization. Psychology, as science, doesn't actually go deep into spiritual aspects and doesn't search for the truth. It merely searches for an object of manipulation. It helps people to become stable, or, to put it simply, Psychology itself, as science, is exactly in the position of material thinking, meaning, in the position of consciousness. That's what happens. What can a psychologist, armed with such knowledge, tell a person who is afraid? Because he feels this death. And fear arises not from consciousness, but fear arises inside due to an aimlessly lived life. However, personality isn't developed, and a person understands that, yes, he did a lot, he did everything that was necessary. Yet, why is there no satisfaction? Why is there fear of a loss? Because he hasn't gained anything, and he is really losing. What is he losing? He's losing an opportunity to gain life. And in this case, there comes this very story, to his aid, that death is just like sleep, that death doesn't exist, you will fall asleep and there will be nothing. But guys, any sleep ends with awakening. And what will happen when you wake up? And you know what people also talk about? About the fact that they are basically afraid to lose the connection with something deep inside that is dear to them. However, their consciousness explains it in such a way that perhaps you will lose connection with your near and dear ones or with this world in which life seethes and boils. Yet, as a matter of fact, there turn out to be such expressions as, wait, but if someone took care of us when we were coming to this world, then someone will surely take care of us when we will be crossing the line to the other world. And again the shifting… This is not true. In actual fact, when a person faces an understanding of death, he doesn't think of his near and dear ones. Every person is an egoist. And when he lives like a beast, then, pardon me, he's the most ardent egoist. And the only thing he can think of his near and dear people is the loss of an object of manipulation. If he manipulated them throughout his life, how will it go on without him now? Nothing other than that. While in fact, in such a person, fear arises solely for himself, for the fact that he has lived his life aimlessly, he has wasted it on an illusion, and now he will face reality. And at the level of personality, there, deep inside, any person feels this. 
Yes, he puts on a brave face and swaggers. Yes, he tries to continue lying to his near and dearer ones and wears his mask of a hero, while in fact he is very afraid and understands that all this has been stupid. And instead of explaining it to a person, and if he has time, aspiration, and an inner desire, then he can still achieve at least something. But people tell him that it is sleep. It's not sleep, my friends. Yet, how to find? People also wonder, those who feel that, yes, there is something greater and life does not end with this lifetime, that a certain transition will take place. How to find this path along which… This path is described in any holy scriptures, in any. Isn't that so? It is available in any religion. They just worry whether they will have time after that, when, let's say, the earthly life is over. Afterwards, they won't have time and won't be able to do anything anymore. How does this transition to that world take place? I'll put it simply. Here's a simple example. You have a certain amount of funds, money, so to say. You can go to a store and buy something, right? But if you don't have money, will you be able to come there and buy anything? No. Time and attention. The power of attention is our money with which we can buy something here. We can buy an illusion that comes to an end. Well, the illusion is, excuse me, everything. It is our communication with anyone. It is building of communication, as they say, maintaining. Yes, with our attention, with our time, we can pay for building good relationships with anyone, with relatives, with friends, and with everyone else. However, will this give satisfaction? Will this give life? No. We can build a career. Will this give life? We can become hermits and communicate with nature only, eat grasshoppers or, pardon me, if we are vegetarians, we can eat only dandelions. Will this give life? No. Any theatricality, no matter what we do here, everything that we do in the material world is theatricality, right? Right. It is illusory. Will it give life? Holograms. Nothing more than that. That will die. It doesn't give satisfaction, in fact. And what gives satisfaction? Something completely different. It can give satisfaction. If a person lives from the position of an animal, he will get satisfaction from any victory. But it won't give peace. Any dictatorship over someone or something else, all this can give him satisfaction, satisfaction from the animal. Yet there's a simple question. Will it give him happiness, true happiness? True happiness comes only when life comes, doesn't it? Consciousness tells the same things to everyone. Why? Because it works stereotypically. We are, excuse me, stereotypical. A simple example. This has often been encountered by the guys who engage in observation in Alatra, in different groups of ours, let's say, and all over the world today. What do they encounter when they work really honestly and try to figure out how consciousness works, who they are, and so on? Very often, they encounter the following. A group gathers, doesn't matter how many people. A thought comes, and they simultaneously start saying that the thought has come. And it turns out that this thought has come not to one person, but to two or three people, depending on the number of people in the group, or even to more people. And is this thought yours? Who are absolutely not involved in the topic of the conversation or something else. How many times has this happened? A lot of times. When people talk to each other, let's say, via modern communication means, and suddenly someone says, you know, a thought has come, and there is a response from the others. The same thought has come to them, who are absolutely not related. Why? Everything is very simple. Yet, they say, what do psychologists advise? That there are your thoughts and there are thoughts of another person, and you need to separate your thoughts from another person's thoughts. In this case, from the perspective of that very psychology, it is said specifically that there are your thoughts, which arise in your mind, and there are thoughts imposed on you. There were interesting moments when a group gathers, we discuss something, and then three or four people talk with the same intonation, word for word, how can this be? It simply comes, it's not even yours, it just dawns upon you. But the point is that later, when three people are talking, at first you are like a proudling, it's my thought, but then stop, wait a second, exactly the same intonation, exactly the same grammatical order, everything is just the same, and the idea is the same, but it simply comes as a package and you either hear it being in sync with it or not. In this case, the very point is that everyone hears. the attention 
attention of many people is directed to something else. Yes, a filter. A filter has worked, and you haven't heard it. While those who are more in sync with it, they do hear, you see those with whom it has resonated. Yes, that's why it turns out that there was such an experience, an insight, that thoughts are really not yours and you can filter them out, you can accept or you can... That's exactly what you told us then. You can choose. Yes, exactly choose. And also, how did this practice, who am I, prove to be useful? We simply adopted it. But it's so interesting, this practice is described in just a couple of paragraphs, but it was of such a benefit in terms of stabilization, so that the process could start. You were full of stereotypes, but you had to get detached from them and see who and what is real, and what is the program in you, that which is mortal and will die, and you don't want to stay with it. And there was such a point when, for instance, you managed to do this practice regularly for a certain period of time, and there was such an interesting effect such a sensation that you started feeling the presence of the spiritual world as an assistance, as the light inside. And there was such a constant presence, like a little beacon, which like a filter enabled you to understand where the truth was and where some thought came, a bad one, and it was better to refuse it. And there was an interesting moment, like a burst of energy. You were as if pressed by these actors, apathy, laziness or something else. Everything would hinder you so that you wouldn't do anything either for yourself or for people. While in this case, there turns out to be some degree of freedom. It is kind of slight, it is tangible, but you still have room for growth. And it turns out to be very interesting in the projects that you become freer because you perform the lotus flower, this very practice, you control… But you do gain a certain degree of freedom. Yes. Therefore, you acquire, let's say, a broader perception and awareness of what you do and why. Right. Of course, it will be more pleasant, calm and interesting for you because you understand that your actions bring a positive response and assistance to other people. Right. You become more benevolent to people. You begin to understand what respect is. You start gaining a certain meaning of your existence. Thus, you feel the beginning of life in yourself. You feel that there becomes more light, warmth and love. And your reaction to various events changes. And you become less of an egoist. Yes, because when you have overcome yourself, at least in one matter, having put the interests of another person in a common deed above your own, it's like you haven't spent it on the actors, you have saved the reserve of this love, of all this. And for you it is like everything has been put into this love, into the innermost, and you are more free. This is exactly energy, be it as it may. Our attention is power, it is energy, no matter what we call it. But this is really so. If we remove the opportunity of investing attention, a person will cease to be homo sapiens, so to say. His spiritual component will disappear, personality will disappear, and only primary consciousness will remain. We will be no different from animals. However, it's not attention that forms this. Attention is just a tool. Right, where you directed, because there was... Yes, it is owing to our structure. Right, and there was such a vivid and clear feeling. It's a little beacon. It's such a fullness. Wow, cool, I'm doing great. And you became careless, stopped doing what supported you, and it sort of dispersed. You as it became as before, again with stereotypes. You feel this apathy again. You again feel the actors telling you something. They impose something bad either about you or about people around or about something else. Then you sit there and understand why have you released the reins which lead you to life. You start working again, you understand, you learn the lesson and you keep moving. Well, but you already see and understand yes. that this thought isn't yours, that consciousness really loads you up like a barge with needless items yes. and needless load that pulls you to the bottom. Yes, and there is also a point here how to find yourself, how to find in all this what gives life, while it does exist, that which is good, which fulfills you, that's where you are. With its sincerity and honesty, it simply brings you to something so bright and interesting that you don't want to waste yourself anymore. Different conditions, different conditions. And there was another interesting point. People ask what to start with, with autogenic training, with meditation, or maybe with a spiritual practice straight away. With a decision not to lie. To oneself. First of all. By the way, Katisha also touched on the fact that people often say at the first stages, I don't feel, I don't know what it's like to express love and gratitude, because in my understanding, gratitude is some kind of thoughts, they say, but thoughts aren't accepted by the spiritual world. So, where should people start? What do they need to start with in order to understand who their true self is? We talked about it many times, very many times. Everything starts with the first step and a decision. But there is one rule, 
If you have made a decision, don't break it. The first steps are the hardest. It is true that the first steps on the spiritual path, if a person has decided to follow it, are hard, but only the first steps are hard. And that's the very first thing, to make a decision. And the second point is control. Consciousness hinders a person. Since it hinders you, study it, right? Yet, who is really serious about studying it? For example, at school and universities, we study subjects, we take it seriously. People who go into science study the subjects they deal with. They do research and analyze. They approach this seriously. Those who are professionals in their work, no matter what profession it is, but we do study it and we build up our skills. However, when we embark on the spiritual path, it seems to us for some reason, and our consciousness tells us that everything must come by itself. You shouldn't be doing anything. The spiritual path is a gift from God. Just because you are here, He owes you. Guys, no one owes anything to anybody in this world. And what concerns the spiritual, it's a chance to gain life. But you have to deserve it and gain it by yourself. That's the purpose of human existence here. The second, most fundamental question is, what is a human being for in this world? Because everyone knows that we are here for a reason. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here, would you? If you're here, it means there's a reason, just to gain life. There is no other purpose. Everything else is on the side. It's all natural, all relationships, building a house, family, work. It's a pattern. Animals and the rest live in the same way. It's just that we live at a different level. But it's all stereotypical. This is embedded in us by the material part. Yet what's the point? The point is to gain life. Therefore, what is necessary to gain it? Why is our time and attention so precious? Where we invest most of it is what we get. If we have a professional attitude towards our work, if we study science, if we learn or study at school, then why should everything be as a gift on the spiritual path? We are satisfied with a prayer or a mantra or some meditation that we were given. We only need to perform it. A magic wand. And everything will happen. Yes, a magic kick or a freebie candle. We lit it and everything got solved in one simple action. No, my friends, here you have to work. And what's most important, work honestly and seriously. Then everything will be in your hands. But when you get into temptation, give in. When you want both this and that, then nothing works. Yes, there comes anger, disappointment, then comes dissatisfaction. Then there begins that it's all nonsense. All this isn't true. The world is simply material and death is just sleep. Good luck to you. Sleep in peace. That's for those who want to sleep. Well, for those who want to live, guys, roll up your sleeves, stop messing around. Do it honestly and scrupulously. As the saying goes, how much shoveling should I do? What do you mean, how much? He says, from morning to lunch, right? It's the same here. Roll up your sleeves and from the moment you open your eyes till you close them late in the evening. And don't relax even for a second. It doesn't hinder your work, daily life, building relationships and everything else. Just watch out for the one who dictates and manipulates you, who palms off desires onto you, why he makes you sulk and resent. No one owes you anything. Why do you get offended? Study how the system works. It doesn't just work in you, but also in the people whom you build relationships with. And they neither owe you anything nor have any obligation to you. Even if you saved their lives and did the best you could for them, and they simply told you to get off, rejoice. Now you are free from the obligations you have imposed on them, that they allegedly owe you something. If you did something, forget it. That's the right thing to do. Because expecting gratitude from the actors is nothing but an act.
there is the present moment and somehow there is no willingness to give and get emotional or worry because of some mindsets, to run around and solve something in a hurry, plunging into it completely. It's necessary to solve issues, but the point is who will solve them and by what means? Will your actors do that while you laugh or will you deplete yourself wasting your life on that? Such an understanding came. I just started asking myself questions. Okay, situation has happened. What does it teach you? What lesson can you learn from it? Where should you work on yourself more? What else is noticed where you don't see? What patterns do you miss? Where do you stumble? And so when I began to ask myself questions, that is, to turn a lemon into a lemonade, when something happened, yes, it happened, yes, it has to be solved, but what is your reaction? What will you do? What kind of lesson? What will I learn here? And it turns out that even if something happened, you ask yourself a question right away. If you reacted, it means that it was brought to light for you. The situation has brought to light that you still need to work on yourself, where else you need to close... Right, where you still have problems and what you need to fight with. Yes, and if you face it with dignity, you actually benefit society as well. You yourself don't give in to provocations emotionally. Because what is the most important point? 10% is the event itself, while 90% is your reaction to this event. Of course. Igor Mikhailovich, in Buddha's Eightfold Path, it is described that seriousness is a way to immortality, and serious sages derive joy precisely from seriousness. Yeah, in this case, derive joy from from seriousness yes. means a serious attitude to everything spiritual. And I have just talked about this. It means to treat it seriously. For instance, we mentioned we have a very serious attitude to our profession if we love it. Well, let's say, what does it mean we love? We love is a relative concept. If our profession gives us sufficient income, we want to build a career, we study and treat it seriously. Yet, when it comes to the most important, the spiritual path, we don't treat it seriously. We content ourselves merely with what everyone does, to light a candle, to read a prayer. It's good if we read it. As an add-on, optionally. Or with terrible fanaticism. We lock ourselves, let's say, in religion, in a scripture. We don't even look at the scripture broadly, where it is written, from the mind, where it is from an organization, and where there are indeed grains. We don't separate that. Why? Because those who are too serious, who have a serious expression on their faces and approach this very, very seriously, I mean, our thoughts, actors in the head, they don't allow us that. A simple question, has consciousness ever been willing to perform a real practice, especially a spiritual one? A simple question for believers, has consciousness ever aspired to actually perform a real prayer practice? Simply for the sake of the spiritual, not in order to beg God for something, to beg for health or something else. That's what it urges to. As soon as a person gets ill, it says, go ahead, pray. It suggests words and the like. Or a simple example, has consciousness never helped? You read prayers? It immediately dictates to you, talks and gives hints. You already perform a prayer, while well, it suggests to you which words to say and what you shouldn't forget, it immediately tells you what is spiritual and what is not. Isn't that so? When you really perform a spiritual practice without right. the dictatorship of consciousness, then you gain a degree of freedom. Then you receive a response from the spiritual world and you get filled. Right? Right. But if you do it under the control of consciousness, with these dictators in your head, and these commentators, then you don't get this. Yes. And the difference is noticeable. It is huge. You have overcome yourself, and in this case, drop by drop, a certain state begins to constantly grow. You have won a little victory, but for consciousness it is little, while for you these are little steps. Every step that brings you closer to God is valuable. While performing autogenic training, we understand how easy it is to do it. But how can we perform a spiritual practice by means of consciousness? There is no way. And what do we need to be able to perform a spiritual practice? We need to master meditative practice, then move on to a spiritual practice of primary, let's say, experience involving awareness, meaning with the involvement of primary consciousness, with some control, and then slowly and gradually go deeper until we do it solely at the level of personality and without losing consciousness, without disconnection, so to say. That's what the spiritual path is. There is plenty of work, there is no other way. However, we are telling, you see, I will simplify. For 2,000 years, there was one situation. For 1,500 years, there was another situation. Well, now we have the third one. We are living in a different way. We have different stereotypes, different associations and different understandings. And thank God, we can talk about the same things, but in a simplified form, in a simple, straight one, without any philosophy, without any unnecessary images, without any religious stupidity. Religion is not stupidity, but religious stupidity is theatricality. 
and retelling which lead to nothing, but produce sort of, you know, an image of seriousness of all this. Well, in fact, it is simple, clear, and understandable. Why? Because the spiritual path is just as simple as, let's say, mastering a certain science or something else. It is a practical experience. And practical experience, excuse me, can only be attained through practice. It will not work otherwise. And if we take any religion, then, pardon me, any religion, I mean, in the spiritual aspect, should eventually lead a person to what? To life. To life, that's right. And no matter how we twist it, we will pass through all these stages anyway. It won't work otherwise. No matter what we call them, we won't fight over epithets and talk about it now. Because all these steps that a person needs to take in spiritual development and on the spiritual path are absolutely identical. You can pass it faster and easier, understanding what you are doing. Or you can, pardon me, drag a whole cartload of various unnecessary things that will distract and confuse you. I'm sorry, a thousand years ago, some old man performed something standing on his left foot. If you perform, for instance, let's take Christianity, Jesus' prayer, standing on your head or standing on one foot, or if you live as a normal person, but go deeper into its essence. Pardon me, who will win? The one who stands on his head or his left foot and performs it, or the one who goes deeper into the essence and starts perceiving it through feelings. What is the main point? It's to develop perception through feelings. The main point is to realize that you are personality, to realize that the enemy is much closer than it seems to you, and the enemy has been living instead of you almost your entire life. And when he lives instead of you, you don't live. Here's simple mathematics. The one who is living will also live afterwards. When the life of the physical body ends, a physical body is a shell. I'm sorry, nowadays science says that a human cannot die as a spiritual component. Consciousness, yes, that it doesn't end with the death of the body. Consciousness doesn't end with the death of the body. They already agree with that. And since they agree with that, hence it's not a part of the brain function. And they agree with this too, because there is a lot of scientific, let's say, evidence when most of the brain was missing. But thinking processes didn't stop. Right, a person functions absolutely normally, you cannot even tell by looking at him. There have existed and still exist many other proofs. The most important thing today is, again, that thanks to Alatra, there is already a tremendous experience of thousands of people who follow this path and gain their experience. And it is confirmed, pardon me, not by philosophy or twaddle, but through practice of many people. And this is very important. And this is very joyful. And this is very joyful. Why is it also joyful? Because the more people really master all this, stop listening to their consciousness and become spiritually free, the more the resonance increases and the more vivid the response becomes from them. And you feel that there becomes more of life. Because there becomes more of it. As if there is some invisible link. There is certainly a link. Just imagine, there is a certain sphere in which there was no life and it begins to emerge. And the more it emerges, the more it resonates with each other. Hence it is manifested, and since it is manifested, it occupies a certain volume and has a certain mass. Hence, what does it do? It displaces something else. Meanwhile, there is either life or death. The more there is life in this sphere, the less there is death. Simple maths, my friends. And a lot depends on you, on everyone. Not just your life, but the life of others as well. We also wanted to ask you about the spiritual goal. What does consciousness draw to people? That there is no point in going anywhere if you cannot imagine where to go. Right. And it constantly wants to describe what is actually… A simple question. If our consciousness takes a certain goal, what does it do with it? It tries to outline it, to objectify it. It objectifies it, meaning an image, an object, a final goal or something else is needed. How can we go there without knowing where? Only in a fairy tale. And here it turns out that we turn a fairy tale into life. Why? Because we go where we strive for. But we don't know the final goal. We cannot draw it. Draw it where? In our consciousness? But who wants it? Our consciousness. And what is the first thing we do? We study the work of our consciousness and we begin to understand that it is far from being ours. The first step, the first experience. And the first experience is sometimes so striking when a person really begins to understand that consciousness dictates to him, it manipulates him. This is the most terrible thing for the entire modern science, psychiatry, and all the rest, because it's impossible to overcome this. 
It's impossible to justify it in any way. When a person is dependent and manipulated by someone, and this is so, but what does this give? Well, of course, if a person is not the system's slave, what does this give him? An aspiration to learn and get liberated. A person begins to understand that true freedom arises when we escape from real slavery. Yes, we can be possessed, we can, pardon me, be enslaved, but this slavery existed and it still exists in our civilized world in which a lot of religions have existed for thousands of years, where one person exploits another person and so on. There are manifestations of evil on many, let's say, scales, starting from people's heads and ending with countries. When greed wins over mind, because people are wild and wicked. How many times did thoughts about death come to you? Let's say, not about your own, but about bringing death to your friends, acquaintances and relatives. Just don't lie. How much during the day do you think about doing evil to someone and not about doing good to someone? Here's the answer for you. You shouldn't be a hypocrite, but should be honest. And what does the spiritual path begin with? With honesty towards oneself. With honesty, yes. Absolutely right. But the most important thing is that when a person begins to study, he understands the cause of all this greed, all this brutality, all this foolishness, and he understands that the enemy exists, and the enemy is insatiable. However, by studying it this way, he understands how simple it is to get rid of it, and how simple it is to escape from its power. And many people do this. Yes, it is necessary to create such conditions so that not only you feel it, but also other people would have an opportunity to come into contact with the same, to learn on their own how the system operates, how all this develops and how personality grows. Because before you became aware of the knowledge, you were like in that circle, like Araman's candle. In a permanent circle, you go round in it, but you cannot get out, you don't know how. And how does consciousness imagine service, like a shield and a sword, a complete outfit, some super-mega tasks that it cannot imagine for itself? Or is it… Service in the understanding of consciousness is what consciousness can do, in the understanding of the masses. These are some wrong actions or right actions, but these are actions directed outward. And in the understanding of consciousness, service means confrontation. Service as a confrontation, right? What do servicemen do? They confront. Confront whom? Each other. A simple answer. There has to be a knight in an outfit and with a sword who opposes another knight, and they start clanging their metal weapons. Yes. Moreover, there are many people who can be of great benefit just by resisting within themselves, by not continuing the chain of evil or saying something to another person, by defending the truth. And this is already service, of course. For consciousness, it's one service. But for a spiritual person, on the spiritual path, these are totally different aspects. It's exactly, let's say, weakening of the system itself. It is elimination of manipulation tools. This is already service. Yes, you can be at your place no matter where you are in that environment. Who else if not you and when if not now? You can actually defend the truth or act as a human or at least do your utmost to get rid of those mindsets. Try to practice what is described in Alatra and what you talk about in the videos. And you have felt this, and you begin to understand that you can really do more, you really understand that you want to ensure that such a… You can do it. You can do it, yes. What you said, this phrase supported me for a long time, and it still supports me and inspires me. If you feel that you can do it, you must do it. And also, most importantly, what can a person do? He can do a lot. He can start speaking out. Yes. So that not only we speak out, and thank God, there are already a lot of our friends who speak out, and you can join this and start speaking out. If you have understood something, share it with others. It already makes it easier. Why? Every path is individual. Everyone still has… Yes, we follow the same broad path, but we step with our own feet. We acquire our own sensations, our own understandings. Somewhere our consciousness worked a little differently, someone's was smarter, more cunning, someone's was simpler, but everyone gains their own experience. And when we share this experience, there are certainly those who follow the same let's say, steps as we do. And our experience helps them not to make mistakes. If they really strive and go honestly and use not only their personal experience, but also the experience of friends, 
and they see the result, which comes much faster and more, and a person becomes freer. Igor Mikhailovich, speaking about experience, even if we take projects, yes, we know that projects benefit other people, but when you do it, the system is absolutely against this purity. It will become, and both in your head and some circumstances will be trying. For example, we had a complex project. We had to get it released within a certain period of time, because, as it turns out, events in the world are happening, and you have to keep up with them. If you don't do it in time, if you drag it out of a month for two or six months, then it won't be so relevant. Thus, I needed to consolidate and get myself together. And at that moment, I had such sort of, well, what thoughts were back then, that who are you with your set of actors who are constantly humiliating compared to this purity? I realized that if I didn't stop this point, constant hesitations, I was sort of in a latter already, I was sort of in projects, I was sort of working on myself already, but these hesitations still remained. And it turns out that such a point came, that it's enough. I had enough of this listening. All the time I listened to one of the actors, or at least to my inner feelings. I was running to God. And then I kind of gave in to the devil again. I listened to him, yes, yes, perhaps I'm so bad. Then again, the inspiration comes, because you're constantly in contact either with people's experience or with some things that are very pure, and you feel that this is living, it inspires. And then there was this understanding that that's it, I'm fed up with it. And it's like it just got cut off. I understood that, well, what is needed to consolidate myself and just act. To invest attention. And let's sort it out simply. Approach it like in science. I mean, there are a few subjects where we can invest attention. There is something that you do, it's pure, light, you understand it, you feel it. There are a couple of actors, it's like an opinion, like a couple of friends, whose opinion you value. And you invest your attention either here, or say, in two or three actors who are like friends, who distract you from doing what you feel. And they start depressing you by telling you who you are, what you are. They also distract you from the main and immediately blame you. Yes. One distracts you, the other one blames you. This is a scam. And they start arguing between themselves about you and make you invest your attention in them. And about my spirituality. Meanwhile, the work stops. Yes. It's very simple. It's really, like Katyusha said, such a scam, deception, lie manipulation, which the actors do in our head. The fact that it's all very cleverly built, it's been worked out for centuries and billions of years. So it's all simple, but it's very simple. If this mechanism was complicated, it wouldn't work. Everything that is complicated breaks down. Only simple things work for many centuries. Thus, it turns out there is such a consolidation of making a decision that you are tired of hesitating. You already truly want this to be substantial. And there appears such a foundation. Moreover, it appears as a response from the spiritual world to your decision. Meaning, there comes sort of stability, it sort of suddenly emerges, and you understand, as if it has cleared up. And there is truly a feeling of a burst of energy and a definite feeling that the spiritual world is with you, that you can really do this. And you get the work done in really releasing it to the world and to people. You discipline consciousness, and the actors immediately become like, okay, this should be done in this way, this should be rearranged, that should be redone, and we will complete everything in a week. And you understand that five minutes ago thoughts just tortured you, you suffered, and there were hesitations. Then this moment of making a decision comes, and there is sort of stability, calmness, and a global understanding of what should be done to make it happen. Now, I will translate this into a simple language, my friends. It's for understanding why this happens. When we make a decision to invest attention only in a good deed and cease to listen to our friends, while the friends cannot live without our attention, and what the guys were doing and Katyusha with them, these are actions in this three-dimensionality. It's clear that attention is put solely in doing the job. These friends, actors, have nothing else to do. They will execute as everyone saw in a circus, a bear gets on his hind legs and rides a bicycle for a little piece of sugar. If he was given a sack of sugar beforehand, he wouldn't get on the bicycle, you see? Because for this dainty, for the food, he will do what people want from him. In the same way, for our attention, for a little piece of our attention, our consciousness will perform what we tell it. Just like a bear for a dainty. But if we give it a sack, and pay attention to these disputes, Katyusha has given a very good example. If we approach this simply, remove all this religiousness, all these conjectures, we can just remove it all and look at the reality. 
Well, the reality is the following. We invest our attention in a good deed in three-dimensionality. We will do it with our hands, with our eyes and ears, and by means of our consciousness. However, either we as personality are a milk goat and a tool in the hands of consciousness, or consciousness becomes our tool. That's the difference. When we invest attention not in twaddle, not in judgment, in discussion of ourselves, how bad I am, I can't, I won't have time, not in hesitations, doubts or discussion of our friends who are around us, say, we build relationships, that for instance, or not doing it right, yes. She's doing a lot, the other one is doing little, what about you? Yes, and even if she's doing it right, it's still wrong, how good or bad I am, I can or I cannot. We stop this rubbish. There is a deed that has to be done because it's beneficial. Well, and eventually we are in service. Hence, we should give something good to people. Hence, we must do this. The actors will run to us themselves and start doing it for a little piece of sugar. Otherwise, they will take the sack from you and won't do anything. And you will be the one to blame. Everything is simple. You see how simple everything is. If we remove all the chaff and leave the grains, everything's very simple, my friends. This foundation doesn't disappear anywhere, it's always with you, this state, there is just constantly this background feeling inside. Because all this is coming from the inside. And it fills you up so much. An action is a continuation, and it's the actors who act, while you just observe their work and don't give them a break. Yes, the more you rely on this inner foundation, the more stable you become. That's right, because you are gradually becoming its part. Yes. And that's where it came from. You give a little, you get more. You'll be rewarded a hundredfold, right? That's what they say in religions. What you give to God will be given back to you a hundredfold. If you light a candle for Him, you come home and you have a hundred candles under your bed. That's not going to happen, my friends. But if you give Him at least a drop of love, you will get a bucket in return. Yes, you'll get a bucket of love. That's the truth. Igor Mihalovich, you said in one of the videos that one has to walk along a wide, clean and solid road because this is the inner support. As for the external support, the devil will sooner or later lure you in and knock it out. Of course. And just note, religion says that one can enter only through the narrow gate. Yes, through the narrow gate. They say, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. Even the point, broad is the road, it is also long, because when from the mind you start walking in a circle and you never get to it, or it takes a very long time, interpreters of different times assume that the wide gate is for doing nothing, for you to walk through it with your suitcases, with all your wealth, pridefulness, and so on. As for the narrow gate… With all your actors. Actors. And everything they drag with them. Absolutely everything, some material desires. But it's impossible to enter, right? Right. Just as it is said. But you won't enter through the narrow gate with them, only you will. That's right. What is the meaning here? That the wide, solid path is the straight, secure path, while the gate is really narrow, because you won't drag anything material in there. And for instance, do you remember, Jesus said that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle exactly. than for a rich person to enter paradise. And the meaning here was not that a rich person or a wealthy person cannot enter, or reach the spiritual world. Any person can. Excuse me, neither poverty nor wealth give an advantage on the spiritual path. Nothing material gives it, but precisely a person's attitude towards the spiritual world does. And if a person, no matter whether he is rich or poor, steps on the spiritual path, stops lying, and approaches it directly and truly, the gate will open for him. It's just that the one who studies the Holy Scriptures, studies different interpretations, simply understands what's being said, when in addition to it he also practices, it's just interesting well, that… Well, if he practices that himself, he understands. Yes. But if he just studies it, excuse me, he's a psychologist. It's easy to get confused. Yes. Very easy, because there are many contradictions, yes. It's a theologian, psychologist, psychiatrist. Yes, and there was an interesting point made by one of the interpreters, who said that the narrow gate is associated with the teaching of Jesus Christ, who calls not for complying with the Latin form, but for internal transformation, and who… And here's a question, why is there no such a path now. In Christianity? Yes. Practitioners are needed. Those who live by gaining the Holy Spirit are needed. After all, the fathers themselves used to say that the most important thing is gaining the Holy Spirit. And do you know what's interesting? From century to century, the same is being said. There used to be holy fathers who were gaining the Holy Spirit. We are not equal to them. And it is repeated in every century. 
It is interesting that consciousness draws that the spiritual path is very difficult. And even this single word, difficult, in any matter, in any material or spiritual matter, stops a person. Consciousness stops. After all for it. And consciousness says that this is difficult. For consciousness, this is impossible at all. Because for it, this is death. Because it's part of what? And we have already talked about it. Part of the material. Part of the one who is called the devil. Is there a place for the devil in heaven? It's, you know, excuse me. I will speak in religious terms. Make demons describe heaven. What will be the result? Hell. It just won't work in any other way. Today's realities. They don't know more. Yes. There is no one closer than God. And we close this gate ourselves by serving Satan. There is nothing else. Everything's very simple. That's how it was. It's just that when I already slightly experienced such a feeling of something real and was going to do a meditation the next time, what was the mindset? Consciousness said that I had to practice a lot and diligently work all the chakras. Like in sports, right? Yes. To work the chakras. Stages. It means to work out the entire muscle group so that biceps will be good, so that… Yes, yeah, so that muscles are duly relaxed. Of course, exactly. So that it flows well for them. What arguments did you suggest? What should flow? Well, pure energy. Through chakras. So that it could assume the purity of low does this have anything to do with the spiritual? Well, how does it work? It is actually an actor who is a psychologist who judges about the spiritual that he doesn't know about. Right. The point is that consciousness applied stereotypes of the material world to what it got used to, to those things which it doesn't understand at all. And there was such a moment when already, well, you're doing your best, you're doing it sincerely, as it is written, meaning you switch your attention to feelings, to what is the best. And in the beginning you even sort of listen attentively, it's like a light breeze, and it turns out that you start feeling. The more you listen, although it's not noticeable every day, the greater it becomes. However, later on, when you look back, for some reason you see, wow, you already do something in a different way, because previously you couldn't do anything, so to say, you couldn't cope with your actors. That's how it was, whereas now you already have, you can calm them down and plunge. There are stages anyway. I understand that there is a very simple path. There is a path of one instant. It was often described, they like it in the East. And pardon me, a lot of various trends, religions, sects, and so on are built on this. Everyone is waiting for this enlightenment, that hop, and a person has become a Buddha and got enlightened. And excuse me, Millions and millions of their followers become sub-personalities, expecting a freebie in the literal sense of the word. There is simple mathematics. I'll put it simply. Let me compare it to sports. For instance, a young man or even a child is lying on a couch and dreaming. He watches a prominent athlete, for example, Sergei Babka, jumping, who beats his own record and jumps at the height of 6.15 meters. And so, this person is lying and dreaming. I'll get up, take a pole and jump at 6.2 meters. I've actually seen how this is done. This is really easy. Yes. I've seen how easy it is. And so, he is lying and keeps dreaming. There are no stages, there's no need to study, no need to train. There isn't any technique or physical training, nothing. He just ran, jumped, and took 6.15 meters. I will say, raise it to 6.20 meters. I'll run, jump, and everything is simple. The time comes, and the time comes for everyone, my friends. He grabs a pole, takes a run. Funny, isn't it? It's funny for her as an athlete. Hardly everyone can grab a pole and take a run. Without training. Without training, absolutely right. Immediately to the first aid center, excuse me. That's the answer. So it turns out that everyone goes to the first aid center expecting a high jump. Yet in order to jump, what is needed? Stages. An ordinary person is living his routine life. He's busy in the kitchen. He has problems with his friend or girlfriend. Little kids are running around. Right. Kids are running around, or he himself is still a child. What's the difference? A person always has plenty of problems. Several actors in his head create sort of an Odessa marketplace where he can't hear anything and can't find himself. Isn't that so? A lot of problems. He has trouble with everything. And so on. Hence what? The first thing he needs to do is to stop. Until he stops this everyday run, he won't be able to do anything. He has heard. He feels that this is needed. I'll drop in the church or in the synagogue on the way. What's the difference, after all? God is one, right? Isn't this what people have in their heads? A person has stopped and felt something. Is it a stage? It's a stage, yes. The following stage, he tries to understand what he needs. Is it a stage? Are the first steps a stage? He sort of chooses. What does he actually need to go for? Of course. In his life. Well, 
And here's the most important stage, to listen to the actors and to go. Pardon me, where there is tea and singing, it's wonderful there. Or to go where people are sitting, in the lotus pose, as you say, working chakras or something else, right? I mean, this is also a human choice, or to go traditionally as grandma was going. Yet looking at grandma, there is no willingness to go. Yes, because apparently it somehow doesn't help. No willingness, right. That is why there are new trends in Christian denominations where it is pleasant to come, talk and sing songs. Of course. And wait a second, are there trends where it's enough to invest attention and you'll get a freebie? To invest your attention, excuse me, in some abstract life? When I will be old, before I die, I will invest my attention in order not to die, right? But as long as I am young, at the last moment, I need a lot of things. I better go where they will teach me to invest attention so that I get a house, a car or something else. You can go and earn, roll up your sleeves, go and earn. It is just money, right? You can buy yourself a house, a car or anything you want. Go ahead. It's a topical point, Igor Mikhailovich, both regarding enlightenment, excuse me, and regarding what all this is needed for, because people wonder, for instance, it is described how someone, some guru, achieved the state of samadhi. Why do they go there all the time? Why do they go into that samadhi, achieve it, and then come back, return from there? If you achieved it, why did you return, And yes? so, a person who reads about these gurus asks, could you please explain why go there into that state? In order to return. What is there in order to return? And what have you brought back? Right. So, seeing such teachings and such substitutions, such flesh-like states of enlightenment of those gurus who describe it on the internet or in forums, a person, let's say, comes up with this kind of questions as to why people go there. Well, why do they go there? They go where it is good, for this very reason. These people also go there, into those states, in order to receive what? Pleasure, first and foremost. But everyone has their own pleasure. That's the difference. Whatever everyone lives for. Whatever everyone exists for, or who strives to live, there's an inner response. Yes. People understand that, yes, the world doesn't end with this fuss. Dirty dishes, excuse me. And right. unkempt hair in the morning, right? Yes. The world turns out to be much deeper. And the body is given to us not only so that we move around here and do something, but able to sit in meditation, to clean chakras as a stage. Yes. And you won't get anywhere without it. I'm sorry, just like a certain stage in other religions, we go through something and do something anyway. Well, if we set everything aside and look, what actually simplifies the path itself? We don't take the stages of approaching the path, but when a person is already trying to learn, will it be more difficult without autogenic training? It is quite possible to throw everything away. No way without it, because there has to be concentration of attention. You will be thrown back later. It is possible to go. It'll be very unstable. Believe me, I've seen many people for whom it was enough just to see a flame, and they became a fire. If we take the masses, such cases are rare, but there are many of them in this rarity. But mostly, people need just to sort things out and go step by step. Whereas, by removing autogenic training, one can learn something else. But which way is easier? Autogenic training, you realize that you can control your body. I mean, you train the actors, train them to invest attention. I'll put it simply. You train an employee, a construction worker. Imagine, you are doing renovation. Now many people will laugh, right? You need to have tiles laid properly and evenly. You train this very tiler that you pay him only for the tiles laid properly. If he doesn't lay them properly, you don't pay. Is it clear to you now, my friends? I've just simplified it. Therefore, here's autogenic training. You pay attention to your consciousness only for what you want to get, and you get it. It's the first attempt, not just to master autogenic training, it's the first attempt to estimate the importance and value of your attention. Isn't that so? It is. Thus, I reveal even the hidden side, which few people think about. The very point of autogenic training is to get what you want in exchange for investing attention. Yes, some people can also say that in the same way it is possible to invest attention in, for instance, we have just laughed about getting a house. What will you pay for? Yes, of course, you can get a house as well. But it's easier to build and then live in it than to get it for free. You won't get it for free anyway. You will pay with your life for it. The next stage is meditative practice. Here, you already work not just via consciousness with the body, but you work via consciousness with consciousness. Because it's a more complex autogenic training. And you will understand better. You will understand the value of your attention much better. 
that even many things which seem to be metaphysical and unreal become reality, just because the system needs your attention. You understand the value of it, and you understand the value of your time. Thus, you already approach spiritual practice, and your inner aspiration becomes much greater. Why? Freedom. At this stage, the road becomes broader, and you see more light. I'll put it simply. Imagine, there is a very narrow trail in the forest. Can you see a lot of sun? Or, there is a very wide road in the field. Will you see more sun? That's the difference, my friends. Different associations, different understanding. And you shouldn't confuse one with the other either. For example, what Jesus Christ said regarding entering, when we try to push ourselves to heaven with all our sacks and possessions, with all the value of our consciousness. You know, it's like, well, give a free human such an aspiration now, and our free, unrestricted human will drag everything with him, including friends. We'll start dragging not only his friends, but also his pubs and everything else. Yet, how can you push this into heaven? In no way. Only a human can enter, without body and without friends, figuratively speaking. Whereas now we are talking about the path. This is completely different. And here's this association with a forest trail, where just a little bit of light makes its way through leaves and a very wide road in the desert that is easy to walk along, and where there's a lot of light. That's the difference. You already approach the spiritual path. And here, what is consciousness needed for? For certain evaluation, for comparison with someone, primary experience, right? Right. Only afterwards, at another stage, a person learns already as personality. When it matures, when it has already learned to freely well, let's say, when you have understood who you are, you have found this all-too-common self and quite grown up, and you already manipulate consciousness, these actors and everything else, that's when you can already go into spiritual practice, return, get from there. Let's say, much power for your attention and already dispose of it, right? Right, that's how it was. There are still stages. There are. Yes. But there are cases without these stages. I also agree with you. However, no pain, no gain. And you've already understood the difference between autogenic training and meditation. You've already understood and there begins some comprehension of what spiritual practice is. There were times when you kept running, solving some problems, I mean, consciousness was more or less active. But when you sat down to do a practice and started to immerse following an already familiar path, you already knew where to direct your attention to, where to immerse and what should be calmed down. Then actors calmed down. There were moments when they sent thoughts about some household issues or fears about the past or the future, or what whatever else, some unfinished business. And there was a moment when I just said to myself, your life depends on it, exactly on the quality of the performed spiritual practice. Do everything you can, to the maximum, all bets on the inner, on those feelings, screw all these thoughts about what needs to be done, about what happened somewhere, it's not relevant right now. And such a moment when you have an understanding that your life depends on it, you can feel it, that it's real. And if you do it, you will live, but if you don't, you won't live. And they are like hope, it's like they freeze, and there is some degree of freedom. And you feel like you get consolidated, have a chance to plunge to a quite pleasant and ample depth, and succeed in dissolving in God's love. When you have an understanding that your life depends on it, then some process begins which gives you a certain degree of freedom. And so you can plunge into the spiritual practice more freely, with fewer obstacles. But then a process of generation already begins, and you don't care about the actors anymore. It's all no longer interesting. Later on, yes, the actors no longer play any role. People also ask a question, how to generate? After all, how does consciousness perceive the power of love? That for consciousness, power is something… Consciousness perceives it as an additional power source, with almost unlimited supply, you see? This is how consciousness perceives it, and consciousness is always fighting for it. So, consciousness has one task. What does it need to do so that personality would generate this food, but would still be under the control of consciousness? That's why it always interferes. But both of these variants are incompatible. It's impossible for a person to become a source while remaining under the control of consciousness. It's unrealistic. 
This feeling, when these processes take place, and you observe your thoughts at the same time. And what happens? After you finish your practice, you ask yourself whether there was… This is the initial spiritual practice, the initial spiritual experience, when a person is not yet separated, not fully divided as personality and consciousness, and when the first steps in mastering spiritual practices are still taken together. I've already told our friends about this. In such a synthesis with primary consciousness, and here, yes, there still may be thoughts. But during these practices, it is easy to lose this perception through feelings. Why? Particularly in a spiritual practice. Because if consciousness begins to dominate and clings to something, after all, it's always active. It keeps track of everything and attempts to associate something with something else, learn something and so on. It turns everything into images. And it's enough to pay attention a little bit, not to perception through feelings, but to an image by which consciousness is trying to brand, name, and associate it all with. As soon as you as personality got distracted, that's it, the practice is over. Here starts secondary consciousness gets activated, and an attack begins. Yes, and then consciousness asked after the practice, was it really a practice, was it a spiritual practice? Of course. But again, everything depends on how deeply you perceive it through feelings and to what degree you allow them to ask questions. Because in fact, consciousness shouldn't ask questions, it should execute. It's you who begin to ask questions already. But at the initial stages, of course, consciousness is active with its questions, with its arguments. It has this iron logic. It tries to draw everything to logical conclusions and somehow manipulate you as personality. But it all comes to an end once a person acquires real experience. Then that's all. Its attacks end. But it is sitting and waiting. As soon as you relax and get distracted, it immediately attacks you. Attacks are inevitable. Inevitable in any case because the beast wants to predominate. It doesn't want to be a slave. It wants to live because it is life for it. Subpersonality, when a person becomes a subpersonality after the death of his body, personality is just a helpless being, so to say, which is, continues to be the source of sustenance for consciousness. Whereas for consciousness, nothing changes. It continues to predominate as before. So for it, it's an extension of its existence, sometimes for many centuries. Of course, it's beneficial for it, right? Personality loses all chances and all opportunities. And here, in the state of subpersonality, a person understands who he really is. Therefore, it is better to understand sooner and use a little bit of time, even out of curiosity, just as an experiment. The first little steps are to observe your thoughts, attempt to get through to spiritual practices, again, through autogenic training and a little through meditations, just to come into contact. And then you can make a conscious choice, because every choice must be made consciously. At some point in time, when you were describing this and even the state of subpersonality, that consciousness says the same thing there, but you as personality can no longer resist it and put it back in its place. And you understand that a person lives in this state of subpersonality during the day, meaning he can't resist his consciousness. But isn't it so? Or is there still a chance? Wait, let's sort it out. If people don't lie, if… Why is it said that there should be absolute honesty on the spiritual path? It's enough for a person to sit down, relax, and think. Doesn't he understand that he is now in a state of slavery? Doesn't a person understand that he's already subpersonality? If he is, say, manipulated by consciousness, if he is controlled, if he is under the beast dictatorship, doesn't he understand or feel that? Everyone feels and everyone understands, but they are afraid to admit it, you see? It's much easier to go into an illusion, to exalt yourself to the level of a bodhisattva during your lifetime, than to realize that you are already inevitably dead subpersonality, and you don't live, you exist. You feed the actors who live instead of you and play the show of life for you, isn't that so? And it's valuable that right now you can oppose this, because there is no… You can, 
while you are alive, while you are here, there, you won't be able to do anything anymore. Yes, there are two options when you cannot do anything. That's what life is needed for. In the past and in the future. Only now you can change it. Absolutely right. Right now you are shaping the future. Yes, that's the point. Also participants say, share with each other and ask how to ensure that the system doesn't erase in the victories. Because now you have an insight and remember everything, but as time passes… Well, at the initial stages, records are used, right? Yes. Because without records, without diaries, you won't go anywhere. Any victory you win is erased by your consciousness in a couple of hours, and it starts telling you that this never happened. But by reading it, you retrieve it all again. Sometimes people themselves get surprised. It's the first stage. And then you just stand and don't hesitate. Why does it erase? Here's a simple example. A person is on the spiritual path. He takes it seriously, doesn't hesitate, and gets experience. He got a little distracted. Hesitations in one direction, another actor, and a person got distracted in the other direction. Where are his understandings of the truth path? Hesitations made him lose steadiness. We go back to what? Pure mechanics, banal physics. If you don't hesitate, you don't lose energy. If you save energy, you direct it into one vector, moving forward, and you move forward. Everything is very simple. If the system makes you hesitate, you'll waste it and forget it. So, at the initial stages, you will hesitate anyway, and you won't go anywhere. The system is strong. If it has kept you for so many years in ignorance and locked up, write it down and don't trust your consciousness. I will remember. Who will remember? Everything goes away and disappears. Consciousness says, I'll remember spiritually. Consciousness says, I'll remember, and it immediately substitutes and distorts everything and accuses you. And was there experience? Yes, it accused you of getting hallucinations, isn't that so? Actually, you've made it up because you had no experience. You imagine that. That's how the system works. Yes, when it happens every day, there is nothing to erase because every moment… When a person lives by something else, then, excuse me, there is no one to dictate to him. What doubts can there be if a person gains what is true? Until you tame these actors, until you learn how to control them, such a point as a skill of control is just absent. There is just no skill of understanding what personality is. Since childhood, no one has ever trained him, no one has ever… Educated or told Educated him. him, yes. The most difficult thing for a person is to find and realize that he is personality. And you, yourself, have to do it. It's extremely difficult. And for some reason, for many people, this is like a split personality. They associate it with some, what's that? Is it like a schizophrenic has it? There should be me and there should be consciousness? Guys, look into your head and you'll understand health only seems to us. What is a mature personality? Because again, mature personality. the one who's young says, okay, it means those whose bodies are older, they're mature. But when you look at the people for a while, talk to them and watch yourself, the understanding of a mature personality doesn't apply to age at all. It has no relation. It may be a teenager or even a child. A child can be much more mature as personality. Mature, yes. Then, pardon me, an old man, a dying academician. Who can't take responsibility. Of course. Because there is this point, willingness to take responsibility for an action, to complete it. Responsibility for his life. For your words and actions, for your attitude, to others, because before Alatra there was the following understanding. Most likely you respect people, you're a good person, you're a spiritual person. But in fact, when I started participating in the projects, I realized that earlier there had been no respect in my life. There were stinging remarks, there were words from the mind, there was preaching, an attitude like I know better and everything like that. And then you begin to watch yourself. Sheer egoism and pridefulness. Yes, you begin to absorb yourself and you understand, wait, but you actually didn't respect people and this is closely related to what a mature personality is. Let's again go back to building relationships. Okay? For people, it's important to build relationships with people around them. What principles is a relationship being built upon? Well, in people, if we put it simply, how can actors get along with each other? A desire of being loved by everyone. Yes, of course. On egoism and balancing, right? Someone submits to someone and there is a creation of comfort zones. Comfort zones are, pardon me, like in any, let's take, for instance, a lion pride or a flock of geese or, I don't know, how it is called, a gang of monkeys. It cannot be called otherwise, for these are little gangsters, stealing everything. Everywhere, in any group of animals, just like among people. Adaptation. Everything falls into place. As soon as a hierarchy has been built, that's it. A group is sort of established. It's convenient to submit to someone and to subdue someone else. And this entire chain goes on and develops. That's what is called building relationships. Comfort, creation of comfort. For the actors. For the actors. And for whom else? Not for a human. 
Well, inside everyone understands that all this is false. Well, inside it is it is quaking and trembling, for it wants realization, this very good. It wants freedom and strives for what is real. Yes, for real life. Right. It is interesting that such relationships in the world, let's say, are actually built on the feeling of ownership. After all, irritation, anger or annoyance mostly arise if your territory… There is infringement of your rights, or yourself, or you are belittled, or what of you course. consider to be your own, or your opinion, or your this is mine, if something of yours is infringed upon. And so, there basically arise these reactions of anger and irritation. As a matter of fact, all this… Or something of yours is not exalted. Or not exalted, right. While someone else is balloon is raised and exalted. This one inflated with the air, but your balloon is not raised. Resentment immediately arises. How come? Mine is better, for it is mine. But if you work on yourself, you already understand that it's an actor waiting to draw attention to himself. If you work on yourself, all this is funny to you, and it doesn't relate to you. While actors will react in any case, they must react because they have such a function, and an external command comes to them for their reaction. Yet, when you understand everything and see their whole reaction, for you it's no longer any kind of Command for action, yes. Let's say, command for action or order for execution. You simply know it. You see it, you understand. You understand what comes to another person, and due to that you can already make a decision or tell him to get lost, because you are talking to actors and understand it all. Why would you waste your time on listening to what a neighbor's dog is barking about? A simple example, right? Or to help the person somehow understand himself, depending on a situation. There is another point when, in your family, you grew up as an egoist, because such conditions were everywhere, so you… Yet, everyone grows up. Wait, but who doesn't grow up as an egoist? Well, someone is less of an egoist, someone is more of an egoist, but all people are egoists. It's embedded. Because again, who dictates to them? An egoist. Me, I, myself. Consciousness works stereotypically in everyone, while a human is, first of all, what? It is duality. It's a beast and an angel in one, and this beast is nobody else but an egoist. It just happened so interestingly. What kind of life I had before Alatra and with Alatra, because when life with Alatra began, when I began to work on myself, understand, feel, and really open up, it wasn't consciousness narrowed to some routine household issues or settling relations, but a global, expanded consciousness. Thanks to what is happening here, a lot of interesting things are happening, studied and learned here. Thus, such an interesting moment came. How to overcome this egoism? How to start this motion to launch this mechanism? This what is it called? Spinning top, so that it starts working and so that you would move to the spiritual world more actively. Such a point came in my understanding of the group that try doing it for others. Let's say something has to be done, and so you first look at the interests of the others while putting your own interests behind and watch the actors, what they think about you and what they try, how they will try to talk about I and me. Because how was it in the world? I, me, and you got an A at school. But if you didn't show yourself with your I, me, they didn't even notice you. Hence what? Hence your status in the world is kind of less beneficial. While here in Alatra everything is different. Here you begin to put common interests and the interests that will benefit all people at the forefront. And only then, somewhere down the list, there are your own ones. When you stop acting under the control of an actor and start listening to a person sincerely, listening to what is common, you begin to put interest of others ahead of yours. And what happens? When you firstly start doing it for others and enjoy, and you realize how much benefit it brings, you begin to realize how good it feels and how bad it was with those actors. But you simply didn't see the difference. You thought it would give you survival, that you would stop at nothing or try to be better better than someone. Yet what does it mean better than someone? If someone in your environment becomes more alive, you yourself become more alive. Everything's very simple. You have to be a human from a spiritual position, first of all. Igor Mikhailovich, regarding doubts that lock a person up at the point of inactivity, so to speak, at the point of choice as it seems to him, to move further, you either go to the alive or stay at the point at that point, so to say. And people send us a letter concerning self-doubt. The question arises, where does this self-doubt, the fear of expressing a real feeling and the fear of being yourself come from? On the one hand, consciousness says that it wants to be loved, wants to receive recognition from others, while on the other hand, it says that you are bad, you are unworthy of all this. Where does this self-doubt come from? 
and why is it so difficult for people to manifest their true selves and all the best they have inside? Let's just analyze the question of what self-doubt means. On the one hand, a person wants to get something from someone, but on the other hand, he has doubts that he's unworthy of this. And I have a simple question. Where's the person's desire to give this good, to be loved, to be respected? Who else should this person be? Beloved, gain recognition Beloved. from others. Beloved, gain recognition. Everything to me, me, me. Desires from consciousness. One actor tells you what you want, another actor tells you why you won't get it, because you are unworthy of this. Does at least any of the actors say that you need to respect someone, that you need to love someone? None of them talk about that, right? It's astonishing that basically everyone, let's say, most people want to be loved by everyone, and there is this value to receive love from everyone. And it's astonishing that when a value is in the outside world and not actually inside a person, as you say, that he himself should understand that this is what I… The law of the universe in which we exist divides everything proportionally. Let's have a look for a better understanding. Let's take a politician, any politician, it doesn't matter who, we won't name him. Some people love him, some people hate him. Let's take any performer, whoever we take, some people adore him, some people hate him. It's the same everywhere. Everything is in a direct proportion. Let's take any subject, whichever we take. One actor in our head is for it, while the other one is against it. We've decided to take up sports. For example, all our life we haven't been doing it, or to go on a diet. One actor says, yes, you should. Also, who does the decision come from? So this actor got a wish to put us on a diet or that we take up sports. Another one starts arguing. Why do you need to take up sports? Waste your time, energy and exert yourself. Better lie on the couch, right? All this happens in one's head and it's all dictatorship. One actor says that you want to be loved by everybody. That is, he gives commands to you as personality. Pay, in order to be loved by everybody, put your attention into it, act this way while the other one belittles you as personality. Thus, people waste their lives on what? On getting love from someone, on gaining recognition from someone, while doing nothing by themselves, right? Exactly, outside the field of his own action. Absolutely right. Or maybe, guys, we should do something a bit differently. Learn to love and respect other people recognize their merits and probably forget about ourselves a little bit. Meaning, stop listening to these actors. Why would I care what the geese that are flying think of me? For example, here flies a wedge of geese. Whether they think about me or not, whether they love me or not, I couldn't care less, you know? Especially if, excuse me, I'm hunting and I have a gun and then I shall think about whether they are tasty or not. That's all. That's the only interest I might have for these geese, isn't that so? It is. It's just that this self-doubt stops people. People indeed get stuck, as I said before, at the point of inactivity. How to move forward from the dead point? Again, let's sort this out. Self-doubt. Whose doubt? And about what? And who is the self here? A simple question. Are there really people who are self-confident? He is so self-confident, but there's still someone inside him who doubts him. For instance, a professional, a doctor, a surgeon, a brilliant professional, I know many of them. And indeed, before every surgery, he doubts. As well as performers, I know many of them. They are afraid when they go on stage, isn't it so? Why? Because their actors dictate to them. However, I already know surgeons who take a scalpel calmly because they know what they are doing. Their actors keep quiet and do what is necessary. The same is with the performers who go on stage. They know what they are doing and why they are doing it. Their actors don't throw doubts to them anymore. They do what is necessary. Meanwhile, the person himself, as a personality, is merely someone who is trying to bring benefit to people through his art or his profession, let's say. Is that simpler? It is, without assessment from surrounding actors, so to speak. At the same time, they don't expect to be loved, respected or anything else, they just do their job. While self-doubt will always be present if consciousness is active and uncontrolled, of course, 
Yes, and I observed in myself such an interesting thing when at the beginning of the spiritual path it turned out that under the guise of self-doubt there was ordinary fear. For example, I am in self-doubt to ask a question about the spiritual that concerns me so much. I'm so shy, I'm so scared. Whereas fear is exactly that very self-doubt. Fear and again, that very assessment. How can I say about myself that I don't know something about the spiritual, right? Right, in their eyes I will look… What will they think of me? That I'm not spiritual, that I poorly work on myself. I don't know simple elementary things. Guys, these are the first steps. When a person is following the path, he encounters the unknown, and consciousness doesn't understand it. And what does it begin to do actively? To ask questions, or vice versa, hush them up and oppress. Personality with these questions, meaning it throws in a lot of doubts. Yes, kind of uncertainty makes a person hesitate. Just like you said, it creates those hesitations. And first of all, if a person strives for something on the spiritual path, to achieve spiritual goals, to gain life as his main goal, what will consciousness do? It will create doubts, cause hesitations, meaning a lack of confidence. As soon as a person begins to invest attention in these doubts, he begins to hesitate. What is the next step? It tells him that he follows a wrong path that he won't reach the goal. Or that he's fine. And divert him towards the earthly, or to one of the other options. Even worse, yes. You will go later, now do this, and tomorrow you will go. That is, to postpone until tomorrow what you can eat today, right? Then I just asked myself, what do you actually want? Do you want to know the truth about the spiritual, to advance, to win, and to be free from the fear, from the lack of understanding? Or will you still be dancing hand in hand with these actors where they need to? Be engaged in a dialogue, quite right. Yes. And I also recall a moment when I first reached the point that I needed to plunge into an unusual state, such a fear of the unknown arose. It can manipulate this. Yet again, it's the work of consciousness and that's all. Yes, and all that. Yes, it begins, I try to come into contact with the unknown and I hear fear and hesitations. But at the same time, such an interest and light appear. And you understand that behind this veil of fear, there is something, it's unknown to you, but it is beckoning, it's interesting, it gives you life, inspiration, that which you want. And now, may I go into detail? Tell me, was it really unknown? to you. After all, you felt and knew it anyway. Yes, since childhood. I've always been looking for it. And is it really unknown? It is what you know and what you strive for. You recognize it. But it is unknown to consciousness. Yes, to consciousness, but when it dominates. And here's a paradox. The more a person develops spiritually and the bigger and freer personality becomes spiritually, the more it recollects. Why, in Buddhism, do they say to recollect? Because this is really so. In childhood, a person was in close contact with the spiritual world. Afterwards, it all gets erased. Every year, we drift away. Consciousness begins to predominate anyway. And eventually, we lose it. Learn anew, yes. And then, we try to learn it all. It's like we walked, but then we forgot. Yes, we forgot how. How to walk, and we learn to walk. Isn't that so? But most interestingly... That's how it happens. Yes, that's how it was. And the most interesting thing is that it was approximately on the same level, 50-50. Fear and interest, fear and interest. But still, you should somehow try it. And since there is more of interest, at some point it breaks through, and at this moment fear dissipates, and you become one-on-one -on -one in dialogue with the spiritual world. Because this fear is false and it has nothing to do with reality. There is always fear from consciousness to lose control over personality. And the freer you become from the dictatorship of consciousness, the more there is freedom and confidence in you. And the easier it is for you to achieve the spiritual. Everything is very simple. There is a moment when it tries to assess the degree of your victory. Is it small or big? There are no small victories, because any victory gives you experience and brings you even closer to this cherished… To your goal. Yes, to be alive, to just live here and now. And there was another question, am I ready or not to accept the truth in its full purity? Am I now open enough or am I not open enough? Assessment, right? Assessment, yes. In order to take this Alatra Bana now and carry it inside yourself in gaining of the Holy Spirit and to convey to people what you have understood. Because if you have understood, they will understand it too. Because it's a need, banali. Yes, once you said that there is the truth and it is given to all. And there is also such a point, such a phrase, that there are people who accept the truth and change themselves following this truth, while there are people who change the truth to suit themselves because they don't want to change. And, unfortunately, we often come across this, and we observe it everywhere and all around. When a person embarking on the spiritual path faces the resistance of consciousness and the thirst to receive, as we just said, to receive love, recognition from others and the like, 
And this desire of his to be something for people here is greater than his aspiration to gain life. Since actors in his head win, and what does a person do? He distorts. He signs the contract and begins to distort the truth to suit himself. Well, unfortunately, this is how many religions were formed, forgetting about what the prophets brought to them, about the simple knowledge, like, excuse me, a sailing guide, like a simple map. Yes, the one that gives life, that greatly feels. The point is to allow yourself to love. It was also, at the initial stages of comprehension of what a spiritual practice is, something constantly squeezed, interfered, hindered. There was sort of either tension or thoughts were coming like waves. And there was such a point, and such a decision was made. How is it to love? Well, and such silence, and you sort of come into contact with it, you start feeling it, you come into contact with this light, come into contact with this real through your innermost, and you begin to understand right away, God, how good it is. And you immediately realize that before there was an actor who said, no way, under no circumstances, you are very sinful, you are full of darkness, you are very dirty. Where are you going? Don't allow yourself even to think that you can love, that you can generate. So what is sin in your understanding? when you listen to consciousness, when you follow what it says. This is it, meaning to be guided by sin. And who is sin? How simple everything is, in fact. Wasn't it mentioned before? It was. And don't people know it? They do. Don't they feel it? They do. Because the truth is simple, and it's always close. But people don't follow it. Why? Because sin is stronger. Actors have power over a human until a human realizes that these are just tools which he must control, but the tools must not control him. People ask how to become stable on the path. Become honest. When a person plays at spirituality, he has hesitations, he has doubts, he has, well, let's say, a lot of free time and a lot of attention, which he can distribute anywhere. What did I notice then? That I sort of did a little bit, a little bit in the spiritual and a little bit in the material, and there was a bit of interest here and a bit of interest there, and eventually I was sitting. In fact, it was not a spiritual path, let's say, but a game. It was just a game. It was just fun. There's a certain group, with some common interest, where you can have fun, play you, can think about the plans of your life, something else, but at the same time play at spirituality. But if a person embarks on the spiritual path, he understands, he honestly, truly understands the value of time and attention. And when he begins to receive the first response, when processes through feelings really begin to occur, then the system no longer has power over him. But the first moments are always like a game. Very few people immediately feel and really go. Yes, spiritual practice turns into a very serious life. When you start to see and understand more, when something greater responds inside you, this gives you a degree of freedom and an opportunity not to be controlled and like a puppet. Not to be just a milking goat. Yes, and a mouthpiece of the system, because there were also different moments. So when it becomes a greater reality than everything else in life, everything shallow, everything that today's society offers, this inner alatra and this work on yourself becomes more tangible and it gives you a greater life then of course everything changes. I mean, it ceases to be a game, but it becomes a real life and the path, because you see something that you haven't seen before and understand something that you haven't known before. Well, the path, again, the spiritual path is the initial stage. Later on, it is life, and you can't call it a path anymore. Yes. The path is when a person has embarked on the spiritual path. He feels something, he aspires to something. He really wants to be a human and not a beast. He wants to live, but not to be, excuse me, a sub-personality afterwards. So, he embarks. And his first steps until he gains life are exactly the path. But when a person has gained life, that's already life. What path is that? 
let's just say the way home and when you came home, there's a difference in that, right? While you were going home, it's a path. But when you came, you are already home. Therefore, I thank you so much for the appearance of such an incredible sun in the world as a Latra. Because without a goal, you don't know why you even have to fight, why you have to fight for this life. But when you have a clear understanding of what all this is for, you rise and act. Name me one single century when it wasn't here. Yes. Alatra has always been here. They call it differently, they interpret it differently, they distorted it, they changed it, but it was and is still here. People who are in search of spiritual freedom, precisely of this love and joy, and when they come into contact with the knowledge, they feel it, because people are in search. Show them the Source and they do everything themselves. Isn't it so? People who feel thirst, real spiritual thirst, it's enough for them to come into contact a little bit, and that's it. Yes, this was and will be in the future, but again, this is where people are in search. Right, and when this feeling of warmth, generation of love is with you, I mean, in any case, practices continue because they give a new depth. The better and more you have been devoted to God during the day, for there are no trifles. You have defended every position where you could, those positions, somewhere with a good word, somewhere with a deed, somewhere with a feeling. Thus, in the evening you come filled. You sit down and start doing the spiritual practice, and it is even deeper and broader. And seemingly, how much deeper can it be, right? There was such a point too. Every time there are new and new depths, with every practice, you gain something greater and new. Yes. Thus, what you have received during the day remains with you. But every time you go deeper, you reach and open up new horizons, for it's impossible to comprehend everything. Also, when you already begin to really feel, to feel love inside, and you understand that every time, with every practice, with every insight, it is endlessly deep, no matter how much attention you put in there, it will always be, and there is always room for growth. The spiritual world is boundless and infinite. Therefore, you will always grow both here and there. It is infinite. Ingrid Mikhailovich, people have a question. What may be considered a life? Why is there such a mindset in the head to consider a life something that is, so to say, manifested in the material world? The system acts in such a way that it imposes on us that animals are alive, even some toys are alive. Wait, but animals are alive. The question is different. What kind of life are we talking about? You see? You are saying toys are alive. Well, yes, human consciousness, again, tends to divert our attention and endow that very animal with life or some positive qualities. For instance, a doggy is running around you, it is sort of devoted to you, and so on. Thus, it is actually subordinate to you, and you are a source of its food, but it is ready to serve you, perform something, execute your orders, and it seems to you that it is actually endowed with a mind, with consciousness. It has consciousness, but it is all in a consumerist variant, and it settles itself, adapts. It understands and realizes that, if it does so, you create better living conditions for it. That's what an animal enjoys, better living conditions, and it fights for them. However, we endow it with what? With human qualities. Moreover, again, both children and adults endow toys, items, or something else with life or human qualities. Don't they? They do. Again, do people do this as personalities or do people do this as actors? Nothing more than that. Actors don't care where you will invest your attention, as long as it is something material, as long as it's inevitably dead. Everything is very simple. People ask a question, are thoughts or some intuitive insights alive? Of course they are, if you give life to them. And what is attention? Attention is the power of life. If you have invested attention in a thought, it begins, let's say, to develop, gain an image, gain an action, then it certainly becomes alive, isn't it so? For instance, a thought to do something comes to you. You go ahead and do that, you already implement it, and it lives. Everything is simple. Does a personality have its own opinion? Such a question? No. Personality, especially an undeveloped one, cannot have its own opinion. Because what is it guided by? First of all, what is personality guided by? 
In three-dimensionality, it is guided by what consciousness tells it, because personality doesn't perceive three-dimensionality and doesn't see it. Yet, can personality distinguish what is good from what is bad? Of course it can. And it does feel and know that. Sometimes we have such a concept as conscience. Not everyone, unfortunately, but some people do. It's an echo of what? Upbringing. Excuse me, even poorly brought up people who behave terribly do have conscience. They understand, but simply step over it. It is poorly developed in them. Thus, it's just a poorly developed personality, where the beast dictates to such an extent that personality is literally in slavery. Although it's in a slavery, almost in all people nowadays, with the rare exception of a tiny percentage, so far. Yet, I hope this is temporary. But nevertheless, isn't that so? It is. Everything is very simple. People also asked us an interesting question that there are moments in life when the system holds all its mindsets, or rather a person's mindsets that exist at the moment, it holds them on him simultaneously. And there is such an observation that it happens in the period, let's say, a week before the release of our videos. And they ask, what can be done at such moments and why does this happen? Maybe Igor Mikhailovich could answer this question. The system will always attack a person when he approaches something spiritual. As soon as a person begins to perceive information, precisely at the level of feelings, the system will always prevent him from doing that. Why? Because this gives a person a chance to understand much more let's say, to turn this little streamlet into a big river, right? I mean, perception through feelings, direct contact with the spiritual world, the freedom of personality. And what does the freedom of personality do? It is an absolute control of consciousness. It's a tool which personality starts using. Who among feudal lords would like to become a slave? A simple question. Therefore, this hinders consciousness very much. It intensifies aggression from all sides and drives a person into such, let's say, a certain dependency from some situations and difficulties. It throws in lots of thoughts as to where he should distribute his attention. Yet, what should be done? Everything is really simple. As always, you see a goal and don't notice obstacles. Adhere to the spiritual world and settle all situations depending on their importance and necessity. Again, by means of what? The tool while the tool in this case should be those very actors who load a person with problems here in such cases. Right? Right. Everything is very simple. Indeed, I've just recalled that once you shared regarding how consciousness, let's say, one actor addresses inconvenient questions to another one. To another actor. The other one gives counter-arguments, and so on. And as you said, when it's you who already address questions to this actor and put him into an inconvenient position, then indeed, like in the Who Am I practice, the one we talked about, as soon as you change the course of things, of course, and drive your consciousness precisely into a corner, while personality already moves to the foreground, then understanding comes. Understanding comes, and this contact through feelings really comes as well. Because in particular, this practice which we talked about, who am I, in my life it also became sort of, let's say, determining my destiny. Let's say this practice astounded me to the depth of my soul in my time, because it was the first practice that I encountered when I came across the knowledge. And I understand that indeed, when at certain point all actors were driven into a corner and they had nothing to counter me with, at this moment that deepest contact with the spiritual world took place, which was certainly a trigger on the path and an understanding who I am and what I should hold on to afterwards. Of course. And it is interesting that everyone has their own path. For you, one practice was helpful. For Katusha, it was another practice. For our friends, other practices. And here, a lot depends on a person's ability not to let it go. After he has understood and felt it, right? It's enough to experience the reality, come into contact with what is true, just once, and then you shouldn't let it go. Then everything goes very fast, and everything falls into place. Certainly the system doesn't lose its ground right away, but then you already understand and know who you are, and what consciousness is. Thus, the devil is exposed, and it's enough to expose him in order to understand that God exists. And then, there's already a choice. Yet, what choice can we talk about? Pardon me. 
When you feel the spiritual world, you know that there is an opportunity to live. And when you understand who you were, who manipulated you, and what kind of future you would have, well, what choice? That's right. Only freedom, only life. There is nothing to choose between because the entire illusion collapses. Absolutely right, it collapses. Yes. The very point is the collapse of an illusion, which gives freedom, although paths to that are different. Therefore, my friends, I would like to say one thing. There are many paths, but the goal is one. Of course, everyone chooses their own, but all we get in the end is God's love. And the fastest and simplest way is to share your love. Then you will receive love from the spiritual world as well. So, let's love each other, and everything will be fine with us, right? Yes. Thank you very much. So, my friends, thank you. Thank you for being with us.